ya ver. Good evening, everybody. My name is Anjali Merot. I'm president of NOW New Jersey, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to end, um, Free the Flow and the Stigma to talk about period and menstrual equity. I just wanted to start off by thanking our sponsors. Uh, we have Senator Scutari, um, the Essex County Democratic Party, the Hudson County Democratic Party, NJPP, and many more that we will go over at the end of the slides. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Annabelle. Annabelle Jin has been a coordinator for the State for Period Inc., which is a youth-led organization working towards menstrual equity. Annabelle. Hi, everyone. My name is Annabelle, and um, I'll just talk to you guys a little bit about myself. So I first got involved with menstrual activism when I started a chapter of the youth run nonprofit period in December 2018. So since then, we've donated over 12,000 pads and tampons to homeless shelters in the community. And in October 2019, I was one of the lead organizers for the New Jersey National Period Day Rally, where we called for free period products in New Jersey public bathrooms. And as Anjali said, I'm currently working with Now New Jersey as a co-administrator for the Quality Period New Jersey Coalition, which is a group of organizations that's focused on passing period policy legislation. So now that I said a little bit about myself, I'll let the speakers introduce themselves and share their perspectives on and why they're passionate about menstrual activism. Oh, um, Elise, you can go first. Sure. Hi, thanks, Annabelle. Um, I'm happy to be here with, with Jen and with Elizabeth and with you, Annabelle. Thank you for your leadership. It's so great to have a young woman in your position. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with you leading us. That's amazing. Uh, my name is Elise Joy. My daughters and I never intended to be running a, an organization like Girls Helping Girls Period today. But five years after my kids did a small project which asked neighbors and friends to bring menstrual products to a party, um, after we learned that there were women in our community, in our school and in our community who were unable to afford the products, um, we are now set to donate our 1 millionth product. Um, and we have been a 501c3 for about five years. It makes me tremendously sad and also really elated that we can do this work, that we have to provide something that's as basic as toilet paper or soap, in my opinion, um, when schools run out of the budget or when social services organizations can't afford or when people show up at food pantries needing them is um, a tremendous, a tremendous thing that we have to deal with that. But I am so very grateful that we found a need and that we found an, a, a way to fill it. Um, we're really grateful that we're able to do this kind of work. Um, Jennifer, would you like to go next? I would, and it's really great to be here. And it's doubly great to be here uh, sharing the screen with Elise because Elise is the genesis of my own story. Um, I, I, whenever I tell sort of my foray into this work, I always mm -hmm. describe this Facebook post that I saw in January 20, 2015. Um, but, but we rarely, I really get to actually say it was Elise's uh, uh, Facebook post and have her sitting right next to me virtually. Um, but uh, yeah, when Elise mm -hmm. and her daughters uh, began uh, Girls Having Girls Period, I was probably among the first people who saw a Facebook post about it uh, in early 2015. And um, in addition to wanting to contribute to the donation drive that they were discussing and announcing, um, because of the work that I do by day, I am an attorney, um, I am a policy advocate, um, and I am an executive leader of an organization called the Brennan Center for Justice, which is a, a think tank focused on issues of democracy and justice uh, affiliated with um, New York University School of Law. Uh, my, my immediate... Um, reaction beyond, you know, how can I help or how can I contribute was, well, why is this so? Um, what is it about the laws and policies by which we live that such an immediate and obvious um, need would go unaddressed 
um, unconsidered and unacknowledged. Um, you know, first I started thinking about it in just in the context of the food pantry, but as I started um, really digging in and looking at um, the various uh, places where our laws and policies and menstruation could and would intersect, I was um, fairly uh, stunned to see how, how deeply ill-considered menstruation was uh, in, in the very structures by which we live. Um, and because I think uh, constantly about representation, about what it means to reform and revitalize and ensure a systems of democracy and justice that work for all. This struck me as one of the most uh, clear injustices um, that I could imagine. And it also struck me as something that was not only solvable in its own right, but a gateway for being able to communicate to people about what true equity looks like in the laws and systems by which we live. So that has been my, my charge for fun um, for <laughs> these past five years. Um, I've, I've you know, kind of taken on this agenda as a hobby. Um, I've done everything from policy advocacy to um, legislative drafting to op-ed writing to book writing on the topic and uh, hope to continue doing so into the future in my home state of New Jersey with amazing activists like all of you um, and across the country and around the world. And I'll stop there. Um, and last but not least, Elizabeth. Thanks so much, Annabelle, and um, thank you so much to Nal for inviting me to participate today and to my co-panelists. I'll just say that um, I'm a, a little bit of a fangirl of you, Jennifer. I've been a big fan of your uh, book since it ca came out, and I feel honored that um, Elise is here to sort of the genesis of the genesis of my interest um, in menstrual equity. So this is really exciting for me. Um, hello, I'm Elizabeth Coulter. I am the Director of Public Health for Planned Parenthood Action Fund of New Jersey. Um, and I think the prompt was sort of how we came into being involved in the menstrual equity unit um, movement. And I kind of came at it from two different perspectives, both personally and professionally. So personally, as I already shared, I read Jennifer's book sort of right after it came out. Um, and it was a real turning point for me because I had known about menstrual stigma, mostly from the context of learning about what goes on in lower income countries um, and thinking about it as a problem that exists over there. And I had never really considered how the problem might exist in my own backyard. Um, and your book really opened my eyes to there are so many things that we can be doing right here in the US to improve menstrual access. Um, and that this is something that I need to take on not just when I'm thinking about somewhere else, but when I'm thinking about how I can improve my own community. Um, and so that's been kind of a tenant of my professional belief is that, um, and one of the reasons I'm so lucky to work for Planned Parenthood um, is that I believe everyone deserves to access the healthcare they need when they need it, no matter what. Um, and that's something that Planned Parenthood has asserted over and over and something that I'm really proud of about our mission. Um, and so this belief is obvious in Planned Parenthood's work to protect and expand reproductive health care um, sort of across the board. Um, and especially in the wake in, in these times, in the wake of a federal administration that has taken every chance that it's gotten to impose new restrictions and barriers um, to accessing reproductive health care. Um, Thankfully, in New Jersey, we have a supportive governor and a supportive legislature. So now is as good a time as ever to seize that moment and push forward in doing things that we can to secure our future when it comes to reproductive and sexual health. Um, and it's not just about those services. Um, it also is about when we talk about education, it's really important to make sure um, that young people have all the information they need to make good decisions about their life and their bodies. And that includes menstruation, um, whether we're talking about contraception or STDs, or like I said, menstruation and how to use those products. Um, we will always support young people um, and advocate to ensure that everyone can access and use those products without barriers and stigma, which is the key. Um, so while Planned Parenthood is not a menstrual equity organization, we are a health equity organization, and menstrual equity is certainly a key to health equity, to achieving true health equity. And so um, I am very excited to be here to talk about that today, excited to partner with NOW and Girls Helping Girls, period, and the Period Project and some of our other partners that we work with, like NCJW, um, to move this issue forward in New Jersey and hopefully elsewhere. So I'll stop. Thank you.
Thank you guys so much for sharing a bit about why you got into menstrual activism. Um, so when I first got involved, I knew like no one knew anything about period poverty or menstrual equity. So I would like to invite um, Jennifer, who coined the term menstrual equity, to talk about the movement's beginnings. Yeah, well, I mean, I would actually say that um, it might feel like nobody knew it or nobody was talking about it, but this is actually a movement that has deep roots, um, academic roots, activism roots, um, and it's taken shape in a lot of different ways. I think what was different about um, the way uh, the narrative took hold in 2015 was that many of the um, activists, um, you know, really, really kind of launching at that moment um, had, had a very deliberate sensibility about how to use the media to tell that story. So um, it's funny, when I um, met Elise and really my brain started spinning around this in, in January 2015, and, and I would say that I wouldn't, it's not a lie to say I really never thought about this before that moment. Um, and I think for, for many of us, whether we're you know 50 or 15, um, that light bulb moment is almost something I'll never forget. It's like, once you know it, you can't unknow it. Um, and, and that's certainly how I feel about this entire trajectory. Um, but the very first thing I wanted to do, as Elise might recall, other than sit and talk for a long time, was write about it. I felt really, really um, determined that this was a story that needed to be understood by the mainstream media, um, by, by it, like, it needed to be kitchen table conversation. That's part of, you know, that's part of, I guess, addressing the stigma, um, as well as, as um, you know, sharing education. Um, and information. And especially for me, because my brain is this weird, you know, uh, pot of, of bubbling policy ideas, my, 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 my real goal was to try to write about policy in a way that was palatable for everyday people. Most of the time when you tell people you're going to start talking about policy, you know, their eyes glaze over and they say, oh, I'm not really interested in that. Um, so to me, to be able to write about the ideas of the intersection of menstruation and stigma and policy, like three really, really not that exciting or uh, popular ideas probably as, pe as far as people were concerned at the time um, was, was a big with an opportunity and, and a challenge. Um, I, I used to joke, I still kind of do, that when I write about policy, I try to do it like when you put spinach in the brownies so that your kids don't know they're eating vegetables. It's the same thing. I try to write about it in a way that people all of a sudden find themselves talking about policy solutions, even, even if they came to it thinking that wasn't their interest or their idea. Um, so the, I wrote this piece back in January 20. 15 and had sort of the the good without being too self-deprecating dumb luck of getting it to run in the New York Times which was a you know which was a pretty large platform for an otherwise green writer um, writing about a topic that a lot of people weren't really so keen on discussing um, but at the same time um, it was really, I think it's fascinating because I was, I was just watching this unfold in real time. There was another article that came out that was actually in Al Jazeera America um, about the plight of people who are homeless and are experiencing homelessness um, and managing health and hygiene needs writ large, but menstruation in particular. Um, and then there was a third piece that ran within a week. Um, it was published in The Nation. Um, it was about a report issued by the Correctional uh, the Women's Correctional Association in New York, and it was an assessment of, um, of uh, correction policy in, in New York state prisons and, of, uh, and reproductive health. And among the key findings were lack of access to menstrual products and sort of abuse and humiliation uh, for people who are incarcerated focused on menstruation. So my, my sort of uh, recollection of that time is that those three articles at the same time really did a very good job of popularizing the issue and creating a, a very sort of distinct and serious um, and um, you know, sort of just easy to digest assessment of what it meant to think about menstruation in the public, public sphere. Um, the, uh, among sort of my first ideas were to, to chart or consider so what seemed to me to be kind of low-hanging fruit in the area of policy making, um, sales tax on menstrual products. I'd been keeping an eye on what was happening in Canada at the time, um, and they had actually succeeded by the summertime in eliminating what's you know the tampon taxes as we all now refer to it sort of casually. 
Um, and that was a fight that it was underway in other places around the world. Um, bringing that to the United States seemed to me to be very low hanging fruit in terms of getting legislators to think about and talk about menstruation, the economics of menstruation, what it meant to be able to afford menstrual products, to even to see if they'd say the words, you know, if, if these were things that they would be willing to embrace. But so too was the agenda to, to um, demand and ensure access to menstrual products in places that are critical resources um, for particularly vulnerable populations. So that was legislation that, you know, that, that, that uh, kind of morphed into legislation uh, here in New York City, uh, or there in New York City, I'm right there right now. But um, that, uh, that included mandating menstrual product provision for free in the city's public schools, in its shelters, and its uh, correction system. Um, and so those two things at the same time, I think really set the table for the agenda that is so live and so robust today. Um, but I think it's important to also for just folks to know that that was a very new and novel policy agenda at the time. A lot of it seems kind of like, you know, easy or yeah, of course that, that, that we could do that or that's what we're gonna rally behind. But that was actually really novel at the time to get legislators to um, commit to that agenda and to, and to um, you know, and actually to see some really quick and early success with it, such that now five, six years later, um, we've built, you know, a really, really great template for what folks can go out and do and achieve in their own communities and in their own state legislatures. Yeah, thank you so much for telling us more about the policy side behind menstrual equity. Um, I'd like to turn to Elise and Elizabeth to talk about um, more about like period poverty and the health side of periods. So what are your thoughts about how much traction the movement has gained in recent years and how are your experiences different now compared to when you first began? I can start. Um, I think Jennifer is uh, absolutely correct in what she said, but I don't think, um, I think she understates her impact. She was a bulldozer from right out of the gate. And that first meeting that we had, you could see, I could almost see the flame shooting out of her head um, because it was just an idea that I had. It was just a project we were starting and it, you know, there were light bulbs flashing. And honestly, within a week, she did have that piece in the New York Times. She had a Cosmo um, uh, petition that had an Im immense amount. It was immensely popular because it spoke to people in the language that they could hear. And I think, um, one of the reasons that Jennifer has really like led the charge for so many of us um, is that she has found outlets uh, that we're meeting the people where they are and in the and talking to them in just everyday plain language. Every article that she's written um, it absolutely speaks to every single person who's ever had a period or lived with somebody who's had a period. It's not at a high level; it's at a human level, and um, I I can't even overstate how incredible it is that just five years later, um, yes, when she, when we all started this, there were lots of, lots of people working, but in my impression, because I had never heard, I, I was clueless to it when I came to the table, we all said we hadn't really thought about menstrual equity before we thought about menstrual equity. And then suddenly we all start, got it, got excited. Um, I think everybody was working with their heads down, working really hard. And I think one of the things that Jennifer, really Jennifer gets the credit for, and a lot of people helped, but Jennifer just has not stopped talking <laughs> and in the best way. Um, she has been a prolific writer on this and has brought it to the forefront. The story is on the cover of New York Times, uh, I mean, uh, of Newsweek Magazine. It's in the New York Times. It's, it's just everywhere. And so now five years later, I find that we're having conversations that are, uh, the starting point is very different. The starting point is not, hey, do you know that? It's, yeah, we know that, what are we doing? And I can't think of another movement. I've been trying to think, but I can't think of another movement that has had so much movement so quickly. We are so far in five years. And with Jen's help, there is such a bl blueprint for making changes on so many levels. Five years ago, my daughters and I were collecting products one box at a time, $5 donations at a time. I'm really happy to tell you that just this morning, I accepted an almost quarter of a million dollar product donation from Edgewell Personal Care that's being distributed to um, shelters and schools in my home county of Essex County, New Jersey, and they're going as far away as Santa Clara, California. Um, 
that is an amazing thing because the product companies reached out to us, saw the work we were doing and said, we want to help. That didn't happen five years ago. And that only happens because we're all talking about it everywhere. And that's, that's what a long way we've come. It's really, it's fantastic. Well, that segues nicely into what was that, what I was going to say, uh, which is that I'm a little bit newer to the, the movement, though I've been following it for a while. Um, personally and certainly professionally, Planned Parenthood Action Fund of New Jersey is really only now just getting started and using our platform to elevate and uplift the work of all of those of you who have been doing the menstrual equity work for all of these years. So um, we're excited to be a part of it in that sense. Um, so I can say personally that what, one thing that I'm really heartened by is the fact that we're having a panel about this tonight, that there are people who are interested and want to hear four people talk over Zoom about menstrual equity for an hour. Like, that's kind of amazing. Um, and I'm a little bit of a nerd, so, like, I certainly would have wanted to join in. Um, but it's, it's so great that everyone, you know, showed interest in this. Um, and that it's being part, it's, you know, becoming part of the public health conversation in a way that, like, you just said, Elise, it hasn't been before. Um, so that's one thing that makes me really happy and gives me, like I said, that um, drive to keep going with this. Um, another aspect that I've seen evolve really positively um, and is continuing to evolve and is something that I know our partners have really prioritized is trying to de-gender a lot of the movement. So when we think about menstrual equity, a lot of times we're thinking about women who have periods or feminine hygiene products. Um, and one thing, like I said, I'm really proud of our partners for doing is being very staunch that this isn't just about women. There are people of all genders who menstruate and making sure that they're included in policy by using terms like menstrual product or period product versus menstrual um, feminine hygiene product um, is, is really important, not only in the sense of creating like expansive policy and legislation, but in also calling people in to say, we're, we're here for you, we're serving you. Um, and having those conversations with legislators and other policymakers um, has not only provided the opportunity to educate them about why including all genders is really important, but it also helps to break down that stigma of naming a product and saying, this is a product for periods. We can say the word period. It's not a dirty word. Um, this is a product for menstruation. It, it helps people deal with their menstruation. Also not a dirty word. Um, and so I think that there's, I'm very confident that the work that's going on in New Jersey really takes all of that seriously, the stigma reducing and um, being inclusive of all genders. And I see more people jumping onto that, and I'm hoping it could even trickle down into other areas of policy. So there's a lot of exciting stuff kind of simmering um, and about to, about to come up. Yeah, so I think, Elizabeth, you talked a little bit about intersectionality in periods, and Jennifer, you talked about periods in prison. So I was wondering, how do you, how do you envision um, an America that has achieved the movement's goals? Like, what do you see as what we should be striving for? I, I mean, I'll jump in with, with, a, a, with a, a kind of narrow answer. I, I, I can imagine sort of a broad answer that, you know, speaks to, you know, equality and justice for all. But in sort of a actually pragmatic way, um, one of the, the strategies that, um, that I've been really interested in from the start, but really only more recently have started to explore um, is legal strategies in addition to policy strategies. So um, when I describe sort of the, the evolution or the early, the early um, steps of of seeking policy reform and with examples, you know, around things like the, the, uh, Tampon tax legislation or, or legislation, you know, focusing on school or prison uh, or shelter access. Um, the, the undergirding of that is, well, you know, it's, it's, it's good policy. It's a good idea. And here are the reasons why and have, you know, um, relied on the goodwill and energy of our, our state legislators or members of Congress to, to, follow, to follow that lead. And some have, and there's been an you know, extraordinary amount of progress. Um, but what has actually always intrigued me from the start is how one would frame the legal arguments to demonstrate that not only is it good policy um, and the right thing to do and the equitable thing to do, but it's actually um, more than that, it would be illegal not to do it. Um, and so uh, 
we have, we meeting period equity, which is the, the small nonprofit that I've created and the, um, with a co-founder the umbrella in which we do this work now, um, actually has forged um, uh, a legal strategy to argue that uh, the failure of states to exempt menstrual products from sales tax is actually a form of sex-based discrimination under the 14th Amendment and violates the Equal Protection Clause. And in so doing that, have worked with LGBT um, lawyers to consider ways that our sex discrimination law writ large um, could be uh, more, more accurately and more fairly considered by the courts um, and don't, without having to rely on um, the, rely on a binary to show that sex-based discrimination has happened. Um, and that's really radical actually, because that's not just about eliminating the Tambon tax, which we hope that this strategy will achieve. Um, but it's also about considering a more forward and more inclusive and more holistic vision of the law um, than has, has necessarily uh, been forged or successfully forged. And this is a new way to do it. We're also using, um, considering how to use state ERAs um, to make the same claims and to leverage ERA law that way. So there's that, that kind of gets to the answer, I suppose, in some ways is what is a, what is a, um, a fully forward menstrual equity society look like? Well, these are some of the answers and see, these are some of the ways to get there. Um, and in so doing, again, I think I just used the word gateway before, and if I didn't, maybe it's because I was having a conversation earlier today where I did. Um, but I've always also considered um, this idea of menstrual equity to be about like the sort of narrow need um, to ensure that menstruation is not something that um, makes it such that anybody isn't able to participate fully in society. Um, but that it also is a gateway for considering how laws and rules and structures that we otherwise deem neutral or to be neutrally applied because they, they, they rely on, on outdated or uh, unfair or you know, just plain old wrong ways of looking at um, our participation in society can be challenged um, and can be reconsidered. And that's like in some ways the hardest thing to do. The obvious injustices kind of can get people, get people motivated, but the things we deem to be neutral or okay or the way it's always been or hmm, I never thought about why that might not work for certain segments of the population is in some ways the hardest stuff to address. So the idea that menstruation becomes a gateway or becomes a wedge, I guess it's the opposite of a wedge, maybe Sometimes I call it a bridge, but I'm not sure that's the right word either. But anyway, the opposite of a wedge, whatever it is that gets us to look at our laws and say, wow, those really aren't serving so many of us. Um, that to me is really where this is going and what this is all about. Um, Elise and Elizabeth, you're welcome to answer this question as well. I'll go. Go ahead. I'll give I'll give Elise a little a break since he's been going before me the whole time. Um, so th that was an incredible answer. I just have to acknowledge that, and um, I am so excited about everything you just talked about. Um, when I saw this question and I thought about it, I went in a completely different direction than that. So if you'll humor me, I'll share how I uh, <laughs> how I decided to to answer this. So. Um, I closed my eyes and I did, I don't know if any of you are familiar with like a visioning exercise where you literally close your eyes and try to imagine whatever it is that you've been prompted to imagine. Um, and as I closed my eyes, um, a phrase popped into my head. That's not that, it's not that important, but it's something that we say at Planned Parenthood a lot, which is that there's no question too embarrassing to ask. When our patients come to Planned Parenthood, they need to know that they can get non-judgmental, stigma-free care when it comes to their contraception, their sexual history, STDs, pregnancy, they need to know that we're there for them no matter what. And when, when I think about that, and I think about reducing stigma around all reproductive and sexual health, that's really what sticks out to me when I think about a world that's achieved menstrual equity. It's a world in which there's no hiding your tampon up your shirt sleeve when you're out and you're running to the bathroom, not only because you're confident that there's probably a product there for you, um, but also that you don't need to hide your product, that it's something that you carry to the bathroom with you just like you would carry your purse um, or whatever else you're carrying in the bathroom with you. Um, or 
that if you're out and you, you need a product, you can say, hey, do you have a tampon? Do you have a pad? Just like you'd say, hey, can I have a stick of gum? Do you have a tissue? Um, and so in my little menstrually equitable utopia, um, that, that's what I pictured. So we call I, that, I hope that there's a day. <laughs> menstrutopia. Oh my gosh. What an amazing word. Yes. So in menstrutopia, I was at a restaurant with friends again because it wasn't COVID in menstrutopia. And I had to go to the bathroom and I had my period and someone gave me a tampon and that was that. I think it's so cute that there's a word menstrutopia and you're all, you both are so excited over it. <laughs> Who wouldn't be? And I would just say that um, one of the first quotes that uh, newspaper or news organization ever had from any of us at Girls Up and Girls Period was from my younger daughter, who was probably 13, 14 at the time, um, who said something about, can you imagine going to the bathroom and not having toilet paper um, or having to pay a tax on toilet paper? No, of course, of course, you can't imagine going to any bathroom anywhere, public building, private building, anywhere, and not having toilet paper in the bathroom. It just goes with bathrooms. So I, I don't necessarily personally feel that society owes all of us who menstruate um, a tampon everywhere we go. But I do think that in places of public service, in places of education, um, incarceration, where people are forced to live in certain places, um, it's a matter of dignity in so many places. Um, it, it should be part of our budget process. It should be budgeted in the same way that toilet paper is budgeted. It should be provided for in the same way that toilet paper is provided for in, in, in certain places. And so I think that when we get to a place where we think about it in the same way that we think about toilet paper, um, you don't have to have an excess and you don't have to be handing it out to everybody, but just to make sure that we all can go about our daily lives. It's mind boggling once you think about this issue that not having something as basic as toilet paper is keeping anybody in our United States from going about their business. And this is as basic as toilet paper. It's bananas. So <laughs> Elise always says bananas. I love that. One of my favorite, one of my favorite lines um, in New York City when the legislation passed in um, 2016, um, the the champion, the legislative champion for the um, for the bills was the uh, council member Jalissa Ferreras Copeland, who happened to be the chair of the city's budget committee and oversaw the city's eighty three million dollar budget. Um, and when she was asked about the cost of the proposed, um, you know, of these proposals, what was it going to cost to have these products in the in the schools, she um, she gave the answer. What I don't remember what the answer was. Whatever the dollar amount was, she answered, and then she re returned the, the the question with, "Have you ever inquired about what the city's toilet paper budget is? Has it ever occurred to you to inquire about what the city's toilet paper budget is, or this board of education's toilet paper budget? Would you like to know what it is?" <laughs> um, and she sort of went through this this whole routine, and it was like the perfect shaming. It was just like the idea that everyone okay. sat there thinking, "Of course, I never thought about what it was." Um, so, it was by the way, good teachable not, moment. It's not a lot. It's not a lot. Whether it's toilet paper or pads, it it's really not a lot. I've done some factoring for school districts, and it's surprisingly you know, in the thousands of dollars, it's not, it's not budget busting at all. And it's such, it says so much about the value um, that a school system places on every person's education. Thank you guys so much for telling us about what you think the future of like in America that has achieved menstrual equity is. It's been really inspiring to hear about it. Uh, so. Now I want to turn to um, COVID. So how do you think that COVID has affected the menstrual equity movement? Do you believe that legislators will be more receptive to period policy legislation now that the pandemic and its ensuing recession have exacerbated period poverty? I'm really concerned about um, the strained budgets. I think that there's budget strain everywhere. And I feel like we've made the traction and we have legislators who want to address the issue. Curious what Jennifer thinks about this, but may just have a really hard time doing what they may want to do because there's just need everywhere. And even if we, those legislators 
and legislatures are able to go ahead and and provide um, so that we can attain, attain the goals that we want. The money's coming from somewhere else and somebody else is losing. So I, I don't, I feel like it's a zero sum game in the end. There's only so much and we all need so much now. So um, I don't know. I, I don't know, Jennifer and, and Elizabeth are in much better positions, but I'm, I'm concerned about it now for sure. I, I definitely don't accept the zero sum game idea because it can't be on our back. It can't be on the backs of people who menstruate that that zero sum game is played. I will say that the policy um, landscape is, has has had some considerable successes during the COVID time and and directly related to COVID. So not just in dis, you know not just despite or or you know happen to happen at the same time, but one in particular when uh, Congress um, passed the first stimulus bill, or it was the second stimulus bill, the CARES Act back in March, um, it included in it this kind of extraordinary provision. And that, that was when I go back to the spinach and the brownies. Um, that was one yeah. of, there, it included a policy provision that was something I had written about in 2015 and sort of snuck it into an op-ed. And it was, an, because back then for fun, I, I would review, I would review various, you know, legislative codes and regulatory codes and see how they didn't, didn't handle or discuss or acknowledge menstruation. And one of them was the IRS tax code. And I was fairly stunned to see that menstrual products were not only con not considered um, a health item by the IRS tax code, but they went out of their way to explain that they weren't going to do it. Um, and that they acknowledged that the FDA and other federal regulations did um, classify menstrual products um, in, in a health category, and they, tax lawyers, just somehow knew better. But one of the practical outcomes of that mis or bad classification is that for people who have flexible spending or health savings account um, opportunities or allowances, um, those items wouldn't be considered uh, as an allowable expense with your own pre-tax dollars. So that was something that um, I, I wrote about in 2015, and it was what actually uh, brokered the first introduction I had to Congresswoman um, Grace Meng from New York, uh, who has really been a champion for this uh, in the House of Representatives and Congress. Um, and together, we've crafted pieces of legislation that would that would rectify that misclassification by the IRS tax code. And they've even passed in the House, but never got, you know, never got any traction in the Senate. So never went anywhere. Um, and then lo and behold, in the CARES Act, with nobody's instigation, um, it wound up in the CARES Act, literally verbatim pulled out of the legislation that was drafted um, and, and introduced by Congressman Meng. So that was actually an extraordinary advance. On a practical matter, it includes like billions, I think trillions of dollars over the time span that it covers. Um, and as a practical matter, also, does it, does it benefit everybody? No, it benefits people who are employed and who are, are fortunate enough to be able to take advantage of, of you know, pre-tax dollar savings accounts, but it really actually sets a standard and makes other, ad, you, know, you know, kind of lays the groundwork for other advocacy. So already in, for example, tampon tax advocacy, um, that, that standard that Congress has been willing to hold itself to um, has, has had traction. Um, I will also say that Washington state was one of the um, only states to pass tampon tax legislation this year. And they not only did so while, while Seattle and the state were sort of the epicenter of the uh, COVID crisis when it first started unfolding in the United States in, in the winter, um, but Governor Inslee signed the bill in April um, and really, well, he didn't, but activists and, and people like me made the point that doing so in the middle of the pandemic was acknowledging uh, the gender inequity of the impact um, of, the, of the pandemic, both in terms of health outcomes and employment outcomes and economic outcomes and educational outcomes uh, for marginalized people and people who menstruate. So passing that law and passing that legislation during the, during the pandemic is, is symbolically significant, uh, especially given that Washington state was such a hotbed 
for it at the time. I mean, now it's all over the country, but at the time, Washington State was was really considered the epicenter. So, and then I'll add one other thing real quickly, which is not just sort of thinking about menstrual products and their provision for for people in need, especially while school's not in session, especially while people are being impacted by you know the by the the devastating economy right now. But I was actually contacted by um, people who were protesting this summer, um, and and as we were as a country, as and still are reckoning with with systemic racism and racial injustice in this country, folks were experiencing also abuse and humiliation on account of menstruation while um, protesting and people who in particular who were arrested or brought into police custody while protesting. And I wrote a piece about it. Um, and it, again, it was one of these just really, you know, eye-opening considerations of the way menstruation impacts all of our lives on in, in everything we do, whether it's when we're going to school, going to work. Um, and in this case, for people who are exercising their constitutional rights to protest, found themselves in police custody um, and were denied products and were denied a dignified um, uh, experience. And, um, you know, in, in, a, in a time and place where we're considering the impact of policing on our lives when we think about how that intersects with menstruation, that is also part of what it means to consider and care about menstrual equity. And the point you just made, Jennifer, is sort of where I was planning to start off that, you know, when we are thinking about menstrual equity or all kinds of health equity in the midst of COVID, um, I think one really important thing that's come out of all of this is that it's highlighted how inequitable our system is and how our system is really letting the people who are already marginalized fall further behind. Um, and that, that's just unacceptable. So when we think about, you know, what can we be doing if we're talking about budgets or if we're talking about how, the, the zero sumness of what's going on, um, now is not the time to be backing off of fully funding healthcare and social services. Now is the time to double down on our commitment to funding the programs that the most marginalized among us um, depend on. And, um, you know, if you factor in the twindemic of racism um, and systemic inequality, um, you know, the, the negative outcomes just are, are magnified. And so, um, I would say now, I know we're in a dire fiscal state in many ways, but um, now is the time to be investing not only in healthcare and social services, but in systems that promote health equity, and that includes menstrual equity. Um, and I think including, like I said earlier, the fact that menstrual equity has been included in conversations of larger health equity and that we've kind of done the work before now to have those conversations about why this is so important, um, hopefully folks who make decisions understand that. And, and that's something that we can all um, talk about and use our voices to elevate. What, one other thing too, I wanted to, that I meant to add, um, as we, as, it's not, not just in thinking about menstruation and menstrual access, you know, as sort of a, a discrete thing, but again, going back to that gateway idea and what it means to look at things that appear to be neutral, but turn out to be, turn out to be, you know, heavily, heavily damaging um, to those who are most marginalized. Um, it's, it's partly what Elizabeth is saying about, you know, considering the, the, the disparate and exponential impact of, of racism, of sexism, of all of the ways that are the inequities that have been part of our system for so long are, are playing out, you know, kind of like three-dimensional explosion in front of us. But I remember actually before, the, before, way before we realized the pandemic, how deeply it was going to impact American society, you know, in weeks before in February or January. Um, I remember I read a piece about doctors um, in Wuhan, China, and it was where the healthcare uh, workforce was something like 94% women. And um, there were these vast inequities in just how they were managing um, their workplace. And there was a piece written on a, like a really kind of random blog, I don't even remember where it was, about the circumstance that within the hospital, 
where they were treating COVID patients, um, the physicians and the healthcare workers weren't being afforded bathroom breaks. They weren't be, being afforded um, clothing and PPE that fit. Um, they weren't being afforded menstrual products. So when you have a healthcare workforce that is largely people who menstruate and they are not given working conditions where they're able to manage it, how are they possibly serving the common good? Um, it's not just their own health and, and safety that's at risk, which is important in its own right, but it's everybody's health and safety that's at risk if they're not able to op, you know, operate at maximum capacity. And then again, that brings us back to sort of what menstrual equity is all about in the first place. It's not just about the people who menstruate, although it surely is. Um, it's about everybody, what we all lose as a society when we don't actually enable everybody to, to fully participate and engage in our society and in our democracy. Um, I know Jennifer, you mentioned Congresswoman Grace Mung, and she wrote the, she drafted the legislation that's called the Menstrual Equity for All Act. And I was wondering if you guys wanted to expand on that and maybe like connect that to the legislation that has passed in other countries like Scotland and New Zealand and England to get period products in, <clears throat> sorry, in all like primary, secondary schools. Uh, I'm glad to start there, um, and it's it's surely worth noting that the thing that the progress that's happening around the world is you know is is part of this global movement. Um, I don't actually think all eyes are looking on America. We're we're doing okay, but we're not necessarily doing well. They're certainly not looking at us now. Um, but I mean, in terms of even menstrual equity. Uh, we have a robust movement, but so too do many nations around the world um, addressing the you know populations that have a lot of a lot in common when it comes to menstruation and stigma, um, and also a lot of disparate impact when it comes to cultural and religious um, expectations um, and the depths of poverty. Um, so I would venture to say that we do have a lot to learn from all of uh, from the activism and advocacy and innovation that's happening uh, around the world, everywhere from the global south to parts of Europe to, um, you know, it, it's, there's, this is certainly a global movement. And especially you pointed out Scotland and the UK where there is a very, very robust movement there. Um, they're doing extraordinary, extraordinary work. And one thing I love actually about the movement there is they too have sort of a integrated policy and legal campaign. Um, and of course that just speaks to my, my heart. That's, that's how I view this work. And I know there's, you know, multitudes of activism from, uh, you know, from philanthropy to athleticism, to poetry, to art. And that's, that's what makes the world go around. But the policy and law stuff is the stuff that gets me all excited. But um, that's just weird me. <laughs> but, um, but Congresswoman Ming's uh, Menstrual Equity for All Act is, is, you know, is really an extraordinary piece of legislation. I, I would dare say um, it's more of a messaging tool. Um, I don't see much, much chance for its progress as it currently stands, but it's important. It's really important in its own right, just as we saw the CARES Act uh, and the legislators working on the CARES Act were very willing and able and glad to cull from it. And that's probably where we'll see the most progress come. But having a standalone Menstrual Equity Act, calling it menstrual equity, using that phrase and that frame uh, is extremely important just for public profile. Um, it's funny when we, I, I worked with her and her office on the first bill that was introduced in 2017 and it was reintroduced in 2019. Um, and uh, I, I was actually confused the first time why it was called menstrual equity for all like that. It struck me as like a little confusing to people that they went, might not understand why, even though I understand why menstrual equity matters to all of us, that they might find that a little bit odd. But I actually came to really embrace it this time around because I saw um, the the breadth of what of what that legislation entails, and the idea is that it covers all corners of of American society and the intersection of law in in our daily lives. So that it covered workplace circumstances and it covered criminal justice. It covered uh, low income um, opportunities for tax relief um, and. Uh, and covered really all the ways we might think about how menstruation intersects with our lives 
um, and and brought sort of this federal the federal levers into play. So when it comes to criminal justice, um, first, you know, um, Congress actually has passed menstrual access provision uh, federally in the First Step Act, which is a different piece again of uh, federal legislation. Um, that's that's more it's fully focused on criminal justice reform and sentencing and prison conditions. Um, but because of the work, I think, of the menstrual equity movement and its its willingness and ability to join forces with criminal justice movement, um, it turn it it um, there it includes a very uh, prolific and prominent piece of menstrual access uh, provision, which which is uh, includes menstrual access provision for people who are incarcerated in federal facilities. But what the Menstrual Equity for All Act does is acknowledges actually that for most women uh, who are incarcerated in America, it is not in the federal system, but it is actually in in state jail, state prisons, and local jails. Um, and so it includes a provision that requires that any state that receives federal funding for its criminal justice system has to include menstrual product provision in its state facilities, which has much, much broader reach quite at a practical matter than does the First Step Act. Um, and each of the provisions of the Menstrual Equity for All Act sort of does that. It takes, it takes sort of an idea and then uses a federal lever to ensure it reaches the most amount of people, um, you know, from all, all the way down. Um, which is very maybe wonky thing to wrap one's brain around, but is it is very um, very potent. So um, I, I that that for all suddenly didn't speak to me like for all people, but for all areas of life, and then and then it all made sense to me. Anyway, I babbled on long enough. I will stop and let my panelists speak too. Yeah, so I think Jennifer has touched on this a little bit, but um, we got an audience from the question asking if you could talk about access to menstrual products in jails and prisons in New Jersey and across the US. So Elise and Elizabeth, would you like to answer that? Uh, we've actually been having a lot of discussions about this behind the scenes for, for a while. Um, I would just say um, I come from a previous life. I'm a television news producer and I've done a pretty extensive documentary work inside the prison system. And I can say that um, not in any one place in particular, but across the board, um, these products are weaponized against people in the, on the inside. They are withheld, um, they are, they are um, traded away. Uh, people are forced to use their commissary, have people from the outside put money on their books so that they can buy basic necessities. Um, where they might be given a limited amount of toilet paper, they should be given menstrual products, but aren't. And so they rely on families who maybe can't afford it to put money on the books to have them. And as a result, they end up having to do whatever they can. Um, it is a problem across the board. And I've seen it in my reporting for years, um, more than a decade of reporting. Um, what it's gonna take to reform that, I can't even wrap my head around. Um, and how you police that is uh, a whole other issue, but it's something that we are starting to talk about and um, are very much aware of and are very concerned about, for sure. Um, if any other audience members have any questions, they're welcome to put it in the Q&A. While we're waiting for a question, I'll just um, make a, I guess, somewhat, somewhat silly comment that Jennifer, I love that you said before that what you were doing for fun was reading the IRS code, because I feel like there was some, there was some comment in the public arena in some election where, um, I, I don't remember the details, but someone was like, who has time to read the IRS code? And now I know the answer is Jennifer Weiss will that. <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> sad but true. <laughs> I was gonna say, you know, I've seen Jen in real life and she's not all, like she does have fun, but I, in fact- She's not that bad. <laughs> no, no, I don't mean that. But in fact, it's always something wonky and nerdy that goes along with the fun for Jen. I don't, I don't know if I've just seen you in the wild ever, Jen. There's, it's all <laughs> wonky. I'm gonna take that as a dare. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you should take it as a compliment, an absolute <laughs> I like nerd fun, but you you definitely win that one. I've never yeah. read the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. 
We're going to scare Annabelle. Um, I guess while we're waiting for more questions, do any of you guys have any advice for the menstrual activism movement in the US? Like, is there anything that you would want to like impart from your own experiences? I recently- I'll say one thing that- Oh, go oh, ahead. Okay. Go ahead, you can first. I was just gonna say for the for maybe the first or second time I came across a, uh, I got a request recently from a public university asking me for if we could donate products. Um, and I will say as a general rule, toward the beginning of school years, we um, work with, we are happy to entertain requests from anywhere from schools, but we like to talk to school districts and make sure that the products are being budgeted for. And then we will help make up where budgets maybe don't go all the way, that it's understandable budgets run out. Um, but I've gotten, I think my second request now from a public university that came back to me and said, no, we don't budget for this. We're just looking for, um, we're just looking for donations. And I responded and said, I am happy to work with your board of governors or your school board or who, you know, whoever it was, um, but to not budget for something as basic as, you know, and this is for their health center, for basic as menstrual products or, or toilet paper in, your health center tells me says a lot about how you value some of your students, and um, and so I I would hope that um, I won't see any of those kinds of requests anymore. I think those are the most basic ones that are so shocking to me. Um, I, I'm hoping that those requests go away now. What I was going to say before, and I, I know that there's a question in the chat, um, <clears throat> is just generally for advocacy, something that's really powerful is using your own story to tie to what you're advocating for. So lots of us, especially those who have had periods, have a period story about a time they were in a pinch and they needed a product and couldn't access it. So it could be just thinking if you're, if you're trying to get involved but not sure where you fit in or where you might, um, where your story might be relevant. Um, I'm, I'm sure everyone can think of a time when they needed a product and didn't have access to one and, and could have benefited from more widely available products or um, from being able to ask without fear of that stigma. Um, one thing that um, I found so powerful about both Jennifer's book and the introductions that Elise and Jennifer shared were how they tied their involvement in the movement, movement to a personal feeling um, that had compelled them to get involved. And so whether it's menstrual equity or racial justice or um, gender equity generally, um, the more you can tie it to a personal story or a way it made you feel, um, the more compelling your advocacy will be to those who you are trying to influence. So I'll leave you with that. If it's okay, I'm gonna jump in with one too, which is just to be, the, 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 the confidence that this issue has sort of instilled in me still, still kind of kind of stuns me when I think back on like, you know, just the trajectory of one's life. And, and you know, before I started doing this, I was 46 or something when I started. And, and I like, I had never talked about this. I'd never just said, I mean, maybe just like with whoever I had to, my family, my kids, but I didn't, it wasn't like I walked around talking to people about periods. And, and now I do all the time and I can't even imagine a world where I didn't, but people will often ask if there's anything, you know, sort of intimidating about, about showing up in a legislature or, you know, in a, in a governing body and, and, you know, having the conversation. And what, what I've come to realize, and I love to share, especially with young folks, is it's the exact opposite. Um, in fact, I, I kind of, it's not like I strive to make other people uncomfortable, but their discomfort is my strength. So in whatever amount of time it takes them to get their composure or figure out exactly if they're going to be serious or if they're going to kid around or if they're going to use slang or if they're going to start looking a little, you know, getting uncomfortable. That's my opportunity to set the exact tone for how we're going to do this. This is the language we're going to use. This is how I'm going to compose myself. Um, we are not going to do this. You are not going to corner me into doing that. And usually what happens in, in about, I've never timed it, but it's probably about a minute, maybe less. Um, the person catches on, you know what I mean? Nobody can't do it. Nobody's ever just, you know, melted into the floor and been unable to have the conversation. 
Um, but it's a real lesson for them and for me about what it means to set the tone. And again, going back to the gateway, there's always the micro macro. Like when you take it to the macro and thinking about how you can do that in all aspects of your life and sort of carry, carry that, that kind of confidence and assertion um, into conversations that we have. I think, I hate to say it, but I think it's especially true for all of us as we're, we're, uh, women here on this panel um, to be able to do that in our lives. Um, talking about periods has taught me to do that. And the corollary to that, Jen, is there are so many people that I speak to who really want to be a part of the conversation. And I'm thinking a lot of it is, is young men, especially, um, but they don't, they know, they, ha they tread lightly, but as soon as you let them in, they love being a part of the conversation. They have a million questions and they're very respectful and very responsive, um, just needed the door open for them. I'm going to add one more piece to that. I, I think we have a question, but I'm still going to still going to just run with a little bit more of the answer. I love that this movement has so much youth engagement and youth activism, but I would also encourage the youth to remember that those of us who are not youth also actually have a lot to offer in the discussion. I can't tell you how many times I'm asked a first period story. And I always say, you know what? There's so much more interesting um, to my life and to even the experience of menstruation over one's life than a first period story, because I happen to be of the age where I can tell you stories about pregnancy and stories about miscarriage um, and stories about perimenopause. And you know what? It's all part of the story. And to think that it all just sort of starts and then stagnates is also sort of a denial of the richness of all of our lives and contributions to social movements. Um, and organizing in this field. So I would, I would sort of add that um, I think there can be a tendency to think that older folks might have less to, less that's interesting to bring to the conversation. Um, but I can assure you that stories of menstruation carry through entire lives um, with equal potency and, you know, emotion and energy. So I will and, encourage folks to and think you just about referred our lives to us as too. older folks. Yeah, I know. I get told I bring age diversity to panels, so <laughs> maybe that's not true this time. I don't Thanks. like it. <laughs> not buying it. Me neither. So I think the question that was asked, we're a little bit over time, but I think we should we can just like answer um, this one in a few minutes. So can you talk more about access to menstrual products in schools? specifically for children that are in poverty and teachers as well, because even though they earn a salary, some still experience poverty. Yeah. Anybody wanna go? I think at least you have a lot of firsthand experience there. Yeah, uh, you know, it's really, it's hard. I wish that I had uh, some magic wand. The fact of the matter is that the communities who need it most are least able to afford to, to provide in those communities. We're doing the very best we can. We adopt as many schools and communities as we can. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do now, which has been pretty successful, um, but it, you know, it's limited, is online fundraisers where people can get involved for as little as a dollar or $2. And you'd be surprised how that can get turned into a month's supply for somebody um, so that you can adopt a community elsewhere. So we could have a Girl Scout troop for example, in our home community of Maplewood, South Orange, New Jersey, adopt a community um, where they where they're needing them, and those can get turned in one month packs with you know a, a little bit of online effort, a little bit of email effort from from parents and neighbors and friends. Um, but it is particularly hard to support the neighborhoods who need it because it, there is not so much uh, ability to support it from within the community. Um, I, it's it's hard. It's really hard. I, 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 I'm sending products everywhere and I'm grateful for the product companies who are helping now on a, on a larger scale. Um, I don't know. The fact that we've hit just about a million products in five years tells you how we're trying to get them everywhere, but a million products is a drop in the bucket. Um, so I would just say to anybody who wants to to help, I can't even tell you how little an effort it takes to make a huge difference in some community. Um, and you're all welcome to reach out to me and I can tell you how you can run an online uh, fundraiser for a week or two and change the trajectory of a school for a whole month. Um, but I think it really is depending on those of us who can 
to, to contribute a tiny bit. We are not asking for $100 donations. I'm asking for $5 and $10 donations to make a difference. That's really, I have companies who will work with me that, um, that will help, help it work down the way um, if people who can can help those who can't. And that's the only way we're going to do it. Elise, one thing I'll, I'll add to that is when I think about um, why this is so important to make sure that schools have access to these products, I think about the disproportionate burden on teachers and school nurses who, number one, we all know should be paid a billion dollars a year, like flat out, like Absolutely. thank goodness for teachers and school nurses. Um, and number two, who, are, who aren't well compensated for the incredible role that they play in our children's lives. Um, and the fact that teachers then have to take on this additional role and oftentimes school nurses of providing products for their students. Um, we talk about this um, sometimes when we talk about sex education, how sometimes schools will have a teacher that's not well or not, not trained to provide sex education or sometimes a school nurse to provide that service. And then kind of everybody's missing out because the students aren't getting the, the sex education that they need from a trained teacher. And the teacher or the school nurse is missing out because they're being asked to do something that they've been ill prepared to do. Um, and so when we think about education equity, menstrual equity is an education equity issue, not Absolutely. just in breaking down the barrier for students to attend school while they're menstruating, but also to thrive in a school community um, that provides students and teachers with all of the tools they need to succeed. So um, similar to how Jennifer was saying the micro and the macro, um, menstrual equity for all in terms of like all corners of how a student intersects with a school community or with education, um, it's, it, it's super, super important. So um, hands down to uh, Elise and to all of the folks out there who are providing products to schools who need them because um, you're doing really, really important work. So unfortunately, I think we're out of time. It was an amazing experience getting to know about your like experiences in the menstrual movement. And I think we all learned a lot. So thank you so much. Annabelle, we're so proud oh, of you thank leading you. us. Thank you yes. so much. <laughs> Excellent job, amazing. Annabelle. Yeah, well done. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Applause for Annabelle. <laughs> <laughs> And thanks everyone for attending.